Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you to H2O for inviting me here. It's been a quite interesting learning process these two days. Um, I'm going to talk about next generation sequencing. Um, this is a name that we give a few technologies that we use to sequence DNA, to sequence genomes. I hope that sounds exciting to you to keep uh, listening. And I'm going to talk about a couple of applications that we use in medical research. Uh, let me start giving you a, a small introduction about a brief history of DNA sequencing. In 1953, Watson and Crick, uh, they discovered the DNA structure, and they won the Nobel Prize for that. Probably you are familiar with the iconic image of this uh, DNA, the double helix uh, structure. 20 years later, we get the first sequence. So it's a sequence as long as 24 bases, so 24 letters, 24 A, C, T, and G combination. Later on, Sanger and collaborators, they created the first sequencing method that we still use currently, not using the same technique or the same methods, because in the past they used uh, radioactivity to label those bases, but currently use something more safe, like fluorescency. Uh, a few years later, in 82, the first uh, database uh, where we store DNA sequences, the GeneBank, funded by NIH. Later on, we get the first automatic machines that allow us to sequence automatically. Uh, we're able to sequence six, 600 bases. We're getting longer now. And even parallelize uh, 96 samples. And in 2000, using Sanger sequencing, we published the first uh, human genome. A few years later, not much, we, we see the explosion of the next generation sequencing. This was a game changer. So uh, from, from that point to now, different technologies, different methods appear. But this was a big change in the sense that the length of the sequence are not even longer. Some of these technologies, we just get a f uh, 100 bases, but allow us to do massive parallel sequencing. Just to give you a comparison, we can compare Sanger and next generation sequencing techniques uh, for if we look at the human genome size, so the human genome is conformed by 3 billion bases, 3 billion of A, C, T, and G combination. For the human genome project, it took over a decade and around 70 million to sequence the human genome. If you look at the machine below, uh, this is a current technology we use for production in the genome center. This is a single machine that in three days is able to produce 1.7 uh, terabases. So you can go past the human genome, you can pass through the human genome hundreds of times. So if you go to the genome center and you request to sequence the genome, they're probably going to charge you around $2,000 to get a full genome, high quality full genome. So now that I mentioned the genome center, uh, there are 20, 25 people running it. Are, we are running several machines. Um, we also have bioinformaticians who do the analysis of that data. And for the analysis of that data, we need our own dedicated cluster. Uh, it's a cluster of uh, 3.5 uh, petabytes of storage and 4,500 cores. This is the new one. We retired the old one, and we actually run out of uh, space to store all the data we've been producing in the old one. Uh, in the center, we try to keep with the technology, we'll be on the cutting edge of the technology. Uh, on the left side, we have the, the Illumina machines that I showed you before. We have seven of them, and that we use for production. And in the right side, we have uh, the next of the next generation. So here is where the name has started a bit silly, or the third generation. I don't know how even to call it. Um, so the Illumina machines are one that you can have on, on top of a desk or on top of a bench. Uh, for example, the back bio, that, that weighs a ton. When I saw that machine, I thought we were going backwards. I thought, how is that? We're getting a smaller in size, but we, we get this as a new technology until I saw this. Uh, so in 2012, uh, Oxford Nanopore introduced this uh, sequencing, this sequencing machine of the size of a USB drive, a little bit bigger than a USB drive. They can plug directly to a computer, and you can do sequencing. You can sequence a small genomes there. Uh, they claim that we, you can have uh, in a grid a few of them, and in 15 minutes, you would get a human genome sequence. We don't use it for production. It's still not ready after four years. But clearly tell us how the future is going. So we're going to be able probably to get our laptop, go to the field, put a drop of blood in one of those sequencers, and get a human sequence 
in 15 minutes, as they say. Um, so this is a graphic of the production uh, of, the, of the recent years. So now we are currently producing 100, 100,000 gigabases per year, more or less. But don't imagine that we only sequence genome. There are different technologies, different ways, uh, things we can sequence. And only 5% of our production is dedicated to genomes. Our, um, the production basically is done for exome sequencing. So let me introduce what is exome, the exome sequencing process. So only 1.5% of our genome codes for proteins. So 1.5% are genes. The rest of the genome, we sometimes name, we name it as a junk DNA. And we basically care, or mostly care, about the genes because they, they're going to harbor most of the mutations that are going to cause disease. So at the Genome Center, we develop with uh, companies a technique to do that, to only sequence that 1.5%, and that's what we call the whole exome. Uh, as you can imagine, it's going to be cheaper than sequencing a genome. You can go to the sequencing center and ask, can I get my genes being sequenced? And for currently for $300, you're going to get your genes sequenced. Um, this is in a scheme of uh, as a diagram of how the process goes. But basically, we extract the DNA, we fragment the DNA, uh, we use a commercial key that is going to select uh, that 1.5% of your genome, and then we put it in a machine. The machine is going to give us the sequence, uh, and it's going to go through an analysis pipeline, hoping that we found a mutation responsible for the disease we are looking for. So this is the output of the machine. So a way to represent it, a simple way, is what we call the FASTQ format. So they give us, the machine gives us a, an ID for every sequence, the string of A, C, T's, and G's, which is the sequence itself. Uh, we currently work with 100 bases, where we work with the Illumina machines. And just below is a way to encode what we call the quality scores, how good is, how confident we are that the base we are calling is the correct one. It just is encoded in ASCII, in ASCII code. So. And of course, it's not we only get a single sequence. This machine just speeds out like something like 5 billion of those sequences every time we do a run. So you can imagine how much data we get out of it. So what we do with it? So there are different, different uh, applications, but most of them, or, if, or a big majority of them, the first step is taking that sequences and mapping back to the human genome, for example. So on the top row, here is a graphical representation of that. On the top row, we have the reference human genome, in this case, is the chromosome 16 in a specific position. We encode it in different colors, so it's easy to understand. So in red, we have the A's, in yellow, the T, in green, the G, and in blue, the C's. And each line below it is one of those sequences that we align to the, to the, to the reference. So as you can see, the columns are perfectly aligned, with one exception. So if you look in the middle, you will see that there's one column that has reds and blues. So we found a mutation. So, and it's beautiful how you can see that 50 of them are blue and 50 of them are red. Most probably, you re as you know, you receive information from your dad. 50% comes from your dad and 50% comes from your mom. So most probably, C's come from one and the, the other come from the, uh, from the other uh, parent. So we have the mutation. What do we do with it? We cannot do much without knowing where that mutation is located, what it does. So the next step, what we do is query different databases and see, for example, is this mutation located in a gene or is it side of a gene? Um, we can look at different databases available. That is, is a frequent mutation in the, uh, in the population? Is if it's frequent, uh, it's going to tell us that most probably it's not disease causing. Uh, what happened in other species? Do the other species, uh, this mutation is conserved? Is a position that is highly conserved in evolution? So it's protected to some, to some extent. Uh, what other algorithms uh, or software tell us about it? It is uh, it's what we call a damaging mutation for the protein. It's going to break the protein. Uh, it has been seen before as a being a disease-causing mutation. So once you do that, you start having information. So you collect that for every single mutation you find in your sequences. Although it's easier said than done. Um, Sequencing a genome is simple, but finding the, the disease causing is not so much. 
I'm taking this from a nature paper where they sequence. This is the first case that they use a whole genome sequencing for clinical purposes. They sequence uh, fraternal twins, so not identical, with uh, the same uh, disease, the same disorder. They sequence the genome of both of them. So they started with a six billion, six billion bases. And then they compare them. And they found that they have 1.6 million uh, common mutations between the both twins. Out of those, 9,000 um, were in coding proteins, in the, in the genes. Out of those, only 4,000 changed the protein. So the other were silent mutations. They wouldn't change the protein, so nothing would happen. Uh, out of those, 77 were rare, were uncommon in the population. So they're good candidates of being disease-causing. Out of those, three look like a good candidates for being disease-causing. And they finally, following uh, extra lab work, they figured out that only one of them was responsible for the disease that those two kids had. And most importantly, they weren't responsive to the treatment, to the initial treatment. Thanks to this uh, clinical research, they changed their treatment to improve the outcome. And I think that's an important um, topic, right? So we've seen, this is a hot topic recent, especially with Obama, Obama precision medicine. So there's a, there's a clear goal now, or there's a lot of money, to being able to use the genomics era to tailor uh, medicine to that, right? So to change uh, treatments to, to, imp to improve the outcome. So i have show you that we can use uh, genomics to discover the reasons why we have a disease. Uh, we can do diagnosis with that. Uh, we can even imagine we have a tumor not all tumors are identical, especially if you have in the lung cancer. So different tumors are going to look different. So we are able to subclassify uh, tumors. Um, we can give you uh, chances of surviving. And as I said, with precision medicine, for example, in the case of lung cancer, we can adapt the treatment. So as you know, probably you know, uh, the the reaction, the the when we apply uh, medicaments to to uh, to a, a lung cancer, for example, that the, not everybody shows the same reaction, right? So some of them respond to the medicine, others they don't respond. So, but if we are able to know why they don't respond and change the treatment adequately, so they have better outcomes. So this is the first case, one of the first cases that we use whole exome sequencing for clinical uh, and also for changing the outcome. This was a case of... Uh, six kids that they didn't respond to the treatment. Uh, we found the mutation that was responsible in this gene called CLC26A3. And after that, they were able to change the treatment and improve the outcome for the six kids. So I'm running out a little bit of time, but I'm going to give you a couple more of examples. So not all mutations that we have are inherited. So we can get what we call the novel mutations. So they appear in your, in your system as a de novo, it's new. So you didn't have it from your parents. So in this case, we took trios. We took uh, parents that were healthy and a kid that showed uh, conge uh, heart disease. And we looked for de novos in all those trios. And we were able to find a set of genes that were the problem. Uh, but here also we discovered another thing, or we realized about a problem that we have in our analysis pipelines. So on average, each one of us have a de novo mutation in genes. Most of the time, the, that mutation does nothing, and except in some cases that can cause serious problems for your health. But in our analysis, we, out of those 362 kids, we found 2,000 de novos in genes. So we clearly our ratio of false positives, even it does, it looks on the graphic that I showed you before, it looks, oh, clearly, yeah, you have a mutation there. We have six times of uh, more mutations expect, uh, we found six more mutations in Obos than expected. So there are a lot of false positives. So we need to change our algorithms and we have to work hard to find the actual responsible for uh, congenital heart disease. This is another case uh, in which uh, we didn't have families. So the solution for finding hypertension uh, responsible genes. So we went to getting big cohorts of individuals sharing the same problem, in this case, hypertension, and finding healthy controls, and we compare them. So just to give you an example, so you may have 
in our cases or in our patients, you may have two genes, A and B. B is showing more, case, more mutations in your cases. And you may think, oh, probably it's gene B that is responsible if you try to do some statistical analysis there. But when you compare with controls, you realize gene B in the population, in the normal population, already shows a lot of mutations. But it's gene A who is uh, it's not tolerant to having mutation. And most probably is the one responsible. And just to finalize, I'm running out of time. Um, all these investigations, or most of the investigations that, that I just show you, are sponsored by or are funded by NIH through what we call the Center of Mendelian Genomics. Yale is one of those four centers. Uh, we are trying to find uh, the genes responsible for what we call uh, rare Mendelian disorders. There are 6,000 rare Mendelian disorders uh, out there. Um, they are rare in the sense that only a few individuals are affected, but when you add them up, uh, more than uh, 25 million only in the U.S. are affected by those diseases. So like the Human Genome Project, uh, all this is for a final goal, which is understanding uh, human disease. And thank you very much. I think if you have questions, I'll take them later. Thank you.